Hello everyone, this is Professor Keen, and welcome back to my lectures on space, time, and motion, where we are looking at Galileo's dialogues concerning two new sciences. We're on page 109 in a student's guide through the great physics texts, and if you'll remember from my last lecture, what Galileo had been doing is defining, first of all, uniform motion, and secondly, uniformly accelerated motion. And he was making the claim that when you drop an object, it undergoes uniformly accelerated motion. He went on to define what he means by uniformly accelerated motion, and this is at the top of page 109. He says, a motion is said to be uniformly accelerated when, starting from rest, it acquires, during equal time intervals, equal increments of speed. So we talked a little bit about that last time. Now, what's coming up in the next couple of pages is that Segredo and Simplicio begin to question Salviati. Remember, Salviati is representing the opinions of Galileo. They begin to question his viewpoint on falling objects. They challenge his assertions that this is the kind of motion that falling objects undergo. And so I'm going to read a short segment here, and I'll comment on some of these objections and how Salviati, or Galileo, addresses these objections. So, um, first of all, if you look at the top of page 109, Segredo comes in and says, Although I can offer no rational objection to this or indeed to any other definition devised by any author whomsoever, since all definitions are arbitrary, I may nevertheless without offense be allowed to doubt whether such a definition as the above, established in an abstract manner, corresponds and describes that kind of accelerated motion which we meet in nature, in the case of freely falling bodies. So remember, just because you define something and you understand the essence of that thing doesn't mean that the thing actually exists. So I can, for example, define a unicorn to be a horse with a, with a horn, a magical horse with a horn that runs through the forest and maidens ride, but that doesn't mean such a unicorn actually exists. You can understand the essence of something without knowing whether it exists or not. So that's what Segredo is bringing up here. Is this the kind of motion that falling objects actually undergo? And now specifically, here is the objection that he raises. This is his first objection. He says, when I think of a heavy body, I'm looking at the third paragraph on page 109. When I think of a heavy body falling from rest, that is starting with zero speed and gaining a speed in proportion to the time from the beginning of the motion, such a motion as would, for instance, in eight beats of the pulse, require eight degrees of, acquire eight degrees of speed, having at the end of the fourth beat acquired four degrees, at the end of the second, two, at the end of the first, one, so he's saying, if you think about measuring time in heartbeats, in eight heartbeats, it will acquire eight degrees of speed, let's say. Then, according to your definition, in only four heartbeats, it would have only acquired four degrees of speed. And in only two heartbeats, it would have only acquired two degrees of speed. Okay, so that's, he's, he's explaining that he understands the implications of what Salviati has asserted. And then he goes on to say, it follows, and since time is divisible without limit, it follows from all these considerations that if the earlier speed of a body is less than its present speed in a constant ratio, as Salviati is asserting, then there is no degree of speed, however small, or one may say no degree of slowness, however great, with which we may not find this body traveling after starting from infinite slowness, that is, from rest, so that if that speed which it had at the end of the fourth beat was such that if kept uniform, the body would traverse two miles in an hour, and if keeping the speed with which it had at the end of the second beat, it would traverse one mile an hour, we must infer that as the instant of starting is more and more nearly approached, the body moves so slowly that if it kept on moving at this rate, it would not traverse a mile in an hour or in a day or in a year or in 1000 years. Indeed, it would not traverse a span in an even greater time, a phenomenon which baffles the imagination while our senses show us that a heavy falling body suddenly acquires great speed. So what is he saying? Let's sketch out what his argument is. So this is Segredo's objection. Segredo's maybe first objection to Salviati's definition. Definition of naturally accelerated motion. That is that naturally accelerated motion undergoes uniform acceleration or objects undergo uniform acceleration. So here's objection one. He says, what he's saying is that if we take you seriously, then if you look at smaller and smaller and smaller increments of time, the, sp the object will be going slower and slower and slower. So if, in, um, if you approach kind of the moment that you drop the object, as you get closer and closer to the moment of dropping, that object must be going slower and slower and slower. So since time is in principle or potentially infinitely divisible, As one considers moments of time 
very close, very close to the moment of dropping. Uh, the speed of the object will be increasingly small, will be uh, increasingly small, you might say. In fact, so small that it's practically not moving. It would be moving so slowly that it would not travel an inch in a thousand years. And this seems to contradict common sense. So this implication, this seems to contradict common sense. It seems, you know, if you go out and drop a rock, it seems like right away it acquires a significant speed. So there's something that doesn't seem intuitively quite right about this. This is the argument that Segredo is bringing up. So how does Salviati address this? Well, first of all, it's interesting. He goes on to so Salviati's answer to this objection. Okay, And you may or may not be um, happy with this answer, but this is how he addresses it. Um, at the bottom of page 109, he says, this is one of the difficulty, difficulties which I also at the beginning experienced, but which I shortly afterward removed. And now he goes on to explain what it is that removed this objection in his mind. And he goes on to say that if you consider what happens, he kind of sets up a, a situation, a, a, uh, a thought experiment, where you have the ground. So here's the ground right here. And let's suppose that you have a stake sticking out of the ground, like a tent stake that's kind of driven into the ground by some distance. Okay, so here's the stake. A stake, and this is the ground. Okay. And if you were to take a heavy object, think about like an iron cube, some huge weight, and you were to drop it on this heavy stake, what would happen? Well, it's going to, if you drop it from very high up, it is going to drive that stake into the ground. Why does it drive it into the ground? Because when you drop that heavy weight, it has some speed at the moment it strikes that stake. And the higher you drop it from, the more speed it has when it strikes the stake. Right? So, the, so by measuring how far the stake gets driven into the ground, it provides a measure of how fast that weight was going when it struck it. Okay, So he's kind of setting up this scenario where we can think about ways of ascertaining the speed that this weight was going at the moment it strikes the stake. And then he goes on to say, well, what if you dropped it instead of from very high up, just maybe a foot above the stake? Well, then it's only going to drive the stake into the ground a little bit. Therefore, it must have only had a little bit of speed. And what about if you drop this weight from just above the stake? you'll find when you do so, it hardly drives a stake into the ground at all. That's because it acquired very little speed. And in fact, if you put it above the stake by just the breadth of a leaf, a tiny amount, and you drop it, it will not drive the stake into the ground hardly at all. And this is evidence, he says, that this weight at the moment of dropping has very, very little speed, which is consistent with what he's arguing about the rate of gain of speed of dropped objects. So that's one of the ways he addresses this. You'll have to decide for yourself whether you think this is a reasonable argument and whether it meets the objection of Segredo. So this is Salviati's answer number one, okay? And he also offers another answer. So I'll say Salviati's answer number two, okay? And again, you may or may not find this to be convincing, but he says, instead of considering dropping an object, think about throwing an object up. And I don't remember if this is at the bottom of page 109 or maybe at the top of page 110. Let me jump ahead to see if that's where it's at. I think that might be where it is, but you'll have to double check yourself. Okay, and he says, let's suppose we consider instead of dropping an object, throwing an object upward. So you take a ball and you throw this ball upward. Well, what happens when you throw a ball upward? Well, it rises for a while. I'll draw kind of a trajectory of it. Let's say we throw it off to the side a little bit so it's easier to draw it. And it arrives at a peak position up here, and then it falls back down, right? So here is the ball, this is kind of a cartoon of what this ball looks like at three different moments in its trajectory. So you throw it up, and it comes to a rest at the top momentarily, and then it uh, is, has some speed, here it's falling back down. Okay. Now, what, he's, what he argues here is when you throw this ball up, if it initially has some high speed, it's losing its speed as it's rising, and it has to lose every degree of speed or every, um, it has to kind of go through every level of slowness as it comes to rest, because after all, it must come to rest at the top, momentarily at least. And then it reacquires the speed as it falls. And he says, if you accept that it goes through every degree of slowness as it rises, 
then it really is no different than saying it goes through every degree of slowness or speed as an object falls. So a dro dropping an object, which is really on this side, is no more puzzling than throwing an object up or making an object rise. Okay. So if you have no objection to what's happening on this side, you shouldn't really have any objection to what's happening on this side, particularly that it has to go through every degree of slowness as it is um, acquiring speed.